It's such a blessing to see all of you here today. And those who are watching online, we appreciate you tuning in. Wherever you're watching from, if you could let us know where you're tuning in from. And we want to say that we're so grateful. We're praying for you. We're believing God for you. If you have any prayer requests, if you could let us know about them, we'll keep you in prayer. Amen. But how many are thankful for all that God has done in your life? All that God's doing in our life, all that God's doing in our church, our West Covina church, they're going to be having their very first church service on August 29th, Sunday, August 29th. So we're going to keep that in prayer. Talk to Pastor Clem today. They're getting everything uh, prepared for August 29th in West Covina. Give us more time to pray, more time to believe God. Um, I think that the first service, we should all show up just to show our support that morning and and uh, as they dedicate uh, that work there to the Lord, it's going to be an exciting time. I've seen all that God did for us. And we, re we remember what God did for us in the park last year, the miracles that God did uh, time and time again. It started in, if you don't know our story, um, it started off in a park. And, and we're so excited about it. This year, we're going to be releasing a book. Uh, with the story of the Remnant Church of Whittier the whole first year. And it's going to be titled, Dripping with Favor. And uh, I believe that God has allowed us to see miracle after miracle. And I believe that every single one of us here today is dripping with favor. Turn to your neighbor and say, you're dripping with favor. Say, if you're dripping, stop tripping. Um, God so loved the world. This series last week, uh, God really challenged a lot of our hearts, myself included, to see the, the greatness of the blood of Jesus. And how many of us here today, we appreciate what God has done for us. We appreciate the blood of the Lamb. And we don't take it lightly. We're, we're so grateful for his mercy. We're so grateful for his grace. And we're looking at what the blood did for us. And this week, uh, we're going to be looking at uh, not the blood of Jesus, but we're going to look at, at the tears of Jesus, the tears of of Jesus. And how many of us know that when you see someone crying, it's because their heart is somewhere. Their heart is somewhere. And in the book of John, chapter 3, if you could please turn there. And when you get there, say amen. We're going to go to verse 16. And when you get to verse 16, say amen. And if we could all stand in the reading of God's word, in honor of God's word. And if you're watching online, if you could please stand in your living room or your kitchen or your dining room, wherever you're at, so you could join us in spirit. The Bible says this. Verse 16, it says these words. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son in the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Anyone who believes in him is not condemned, but anyone who does not believe in him is condemned already. While we go ahead and pray, Lord, we thank you for the privilege to be here today. I pray right now, Lord, that I would decrease and that you would increase. I pray, Lord, that today, as last week, last Sunday, and this Thursday, you did a stirring in our hearts, in our lives. I pray, Lord, that you would stir us for your honor and your glory. I pray that you bring revival to every single one of our hearts and minds. Lord, that you would awaken us, God, out of our slumber, God. And I pray, Lord, that you bring revival to our church, God. Bring revival to the churches, Lord, that are seeking hard after you. I pray, Lord, that today would be a day of transformation and change. I pray that today would be a day of breakthrough, Lord, of new beginnings. Lord, I pray today that your name would be highly exalted and glorified in all of God's people said, amen and amen. You may be seated this afternoon. I was reading about why people go to church and the very uh, top reason is, is something that I think that all of us, as we hear today's message, we're going to see, man, that's, that's the main reason why people go to church. Um, guess what? The reason why people go to church, uh, I, I knew this to be true. Some of you probably already know this, but it's not because of a pastor. It's not because of a personality. That's not why people go to church. Um, I think a lot of times we say, oh, you know what? Uh, it's going to be the pastor that's going to get these people saved. No, it's your responsibility as well to build the kingdom. Don't put everything on the pastor's shoulders because we're all part of the body here. So if you bring somebody to the church and you say, man, pastor, did you get saved? It's your fault. No, it's not my fault. It's all of our fault. Some of you didn't like that this morning, uh, this afternoon. 
but it's all of our responsibility to build people for his kingdom. Amen. Um, you might say, well, what brings people into church? You might say, it's the music. No, music wasn't even on the list why people give their lives over to the Lord. You might say, well, it's, it's the, the hospitality. Guess what? No, hospitality was not even on the list. The very, starting from the list in the bottom, 16% said they went to church to please their spouse. Hello, somebody. Some of you are like, Pastor, you're preaching to me because if I didn't come to church today, my husband would be very mad at me. Another reason why people go to church, the next one, is to meet new people and socialize, 19%. Uh, 31% say they feel obligated to go to church. 37% say they continue to go because it's kind of a family tradition. 59% they, they, they go to church because they say they find the sermons valuable. 66% say they go for comfort in times of trouble or sorrow. This is the second reason why people go to church, and I think this is so true, but that their children can have a moral foundation, a moral foundation. And the last reason, it all belongs to King Jesus, is to get closer to God. 81% of people, they go to church because they want to know Jesus. They don't want to know Danny. They don't want to know Pastor George. They don't want to know Eric. They don't want to know Brother Richard. They don't want to know. They want to know Jesus. All right. Um, that's the reason why people go to church is because they want to know Jesus. That's why you're tuning in right now is because you want to know Jesus. But how can people know about Jesus if no one's talking about Jesus? I struck a nerve right now. How can people know if nobody tells them about Jesus? Tells them about Jesus. And I believe that God wants to bring 300 people in this church. You might say, why 300? I don't even know why 300. I just feel like God wants to double this church. But are we ready? Are we ready for some more fish in here? Are we ready for some dirty fish? Are we ready for some smelly fish? Are we ready for some sinful fish? Are we ready for, are, are our borders ready for God to do that right now, to bring in some demon-possessed people and get delivered by the power of Jesus Christ? Are we ready for God to bring in some drug addicts, some atheists, some goody two-shoe college graduates who think they know everything, but God's going to break down that pride? Are we ready for that? Am I ready for that? I believe that God is looking for a people, for a church who will say, I am ready for the harvest. I am ready. But how can they know if nobody tells them about Jesus? See, for many of us, we have confined our talk about Jesus to these four walls. We talk about Jesus on Sundays. We talk about Jesus as we're eating after church at the California Grill with all of our homies, all of our friends. We're talking about Jesus. But then we go to PIH. And then we go to our job at Pet Boys. Our, as you're at the preschool, hello ladies. And we stop talking about Jesus, you might say, well, pastor, they're going to find me. They're going to they're going to they're going to give me, you know, they're going to write me up. Who cares? Wow. Some of you are like, pastor, I care. I don't want to lose my job. Well, sometimes you got to be willing to lose your job to stand for the truth. It happens. So, we get to this place of evangelism, seeing the heart of Jesus. Jesus, in the book of Matthew, chapter 9, while we turn there, and I think we get that mindset, we think, you know what, I'm not called to talk about Jesus. Only those who have the gift of evangelism are called to talk about Jesus. And how many of you know that if there's something good going on in your life, you're going to want to talk about it? You're gonna wanna, you wanna, you wanna brag about it. You're gonna wanna tell your friends about it. The Bible says this. 
in verse 36 of chapter 9, it says, when he saw the crowds, he felt compassion. Everyone say compassion. Turn to your other neighbor and say compassion moves us to action. Turn back to your other neighbor and say, are you ready to work? Tell them, I said, are you ready to work? Some of you are saying it's the Sabbath. So the Bible says this, he had compassion on them because they were distressed and dejected like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is abundant. Everyone say the harvest is abundant. The harvest is abundant. Now let me stop there. A lot of us, we think, oh, you know what? We're living in a, in a, in a, in a postmodern culture. People, Christianity is on the de uh, decline. You know what? No one's going to get saved. You know, everyone's going to get the, you know, everyone's just going to go to hell. You know, everyone's gonna, what, let me ask you this. When was the last time you told somebody about Jesus? And we think, oh, man, the demons are getting so strong. The Bible says greater is he who is in us than he that is in the world. You know, no matter which generation we're in, they need the gospel. They need the gospel. I don't care if they were educated at Princeton or Yale or Cornell University or they have a degree from Fuller and they know about God more than you. But have they been baptized in the Holy Spirit? So the Bible says that Jesus said they're distressed and dejected like sheep without a shepherd. And he said to the disciples, the harvest is abundant. That means there's a huge harvest right now in Whittier, California, in Norwalk, California, in La Puente, California, in West Covina, in Southern California, there is a huge harvest. But the workers are few. The workers are few. The workers are few. Wow. Lord, help us. Jesus, help us. To be those workers that he's called us to be. Today, how many are you ready for that 300 person harvest? You that are watching, how many are you ready for that 300, 400, 500, 600,000? I'm, I'm not just talking about that's gonna come into this church, I'm talking about it's gonna flood West Covina, it's gonna flood all these churches that are on fire for the Lord. There is gonna flood the churches that raise their voices. God is going to bring revival and increase to those churches. Let me say this. They did a study on dying churches. But this study can be transposed to dying Christians. And they began to look, why do churches die? Why do churches have momentum? See, sometimes churches have momentum from things that took place years before, years before, years before. And they're like a train on the tracks. They're going forward. Why? Because of all these labors, labor that took place. And they're going forward. They're going forward. But there's no fresh fuel going into that train. I'm going somewhere with this. I'm going somewhere with this. See, we might look like we're doing good. We have about 200 people here today. We have people watching online. And we look like we're doing good. But let me say this, this is tied into prayer and fasting and evangelism. I'm going to say that one more time. This momentum that we have is a gift from the grace of God that's not tied into any of us, myself included. But this is tied into labor for the kingdom. Because when you labor, you build momentum. Let me give you another example. When a church dies, they have found a church that dies is no longer evangelizing. They're no longer out in the streets. They're no longer inviting their coworkers. They're no longer telling people the good news of the kingdom. They're no longer sharing the gospel with other people. Now, we know that churches die without evangelism. Let's get that in our hearts. Our church will die if we do not evangelize. It will. It's a guarantee. Because when you're evangelizing, you're abiding in him. You're speaking about him. You're, the Bible says that if we're ashamed of him, he'll be ashamed of us. But if we proclaim him, that he'll proclaim us in front of his father in heaven. The Bible says that when we lift up the name of Jesus, that he draws all men unto him. All men unto him. When we lift up his name. Now, a church dies without evangelism. A Christian dies without evangelism. You're wondering, why am I a dead believer? Why am I a dead Christian? Why do I feel so dejected, rejected? Why do I feel like I'm not dripping with favor? I'm just tripping all the time. 
I don't want to be here, Pastor Danny. I want to leave right now. When was the last time you shared the gospel with someone? When was the last time that you told someone about Jesus Christ? We all have a megaphone here today. I said we all have a megaphone. That means we all have an audience. We all have an audience. We all have an audience today. And are you letting fear stop you? Are you letting past failure stop you? Do you feel like you're unqualified to tell somebody about Jesus? You feel like, you know what, I can't tell nobody about the Lord. I am unqualified. You know what, God, he makes the unqualified qualified. You don't have to have a PhD in evangelism to evangelize. You don't have to be a Bible scholar to evangelize. It's very simple. The Bible says in the book of John chapter 1, you might say, man, Pastor Danny, uh, I, I think I need to know a lot. I need to do a lot. Now, look at, look at Peter's brother, Andrew, what he did. And he led his brother to the Lord. I want you to think about that time somebody told you about Jesus. It might have been your mom taking you to church. How many of us know you moms, you evangelize your homes? Did you know that? A lot of times we think we have to be evangelizing out in the streets. But you couldn't evangelize at the dinner table. That's a harvest field. That is the harvest field. You could evangelize in the break room. You could evangelize at break time. You can evangelize. There's so many places where you can evangelize. You, we need to evangelize even with your children and your spouse. You need to evangelize. The Bible says in John chapter 1 verse 41. Uh, I'm sorry, in verse 40 it says, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who had heard John and followed him. He first found his own brother Simon. He told him, we have found the Messiah. We have found the Messiah, which is translated to Christ. And he brought Simon to Jesus. He brought his brother to Jesus. He went to his audience. He went to his brother. He said, brother, we found the Messiah. We found the one. And he brought his brother to Jesus. You and I... We need to pray for our friends. We need to pray for our co-workers. We need to pray for our mom and our dad, our unsaved uncles, our unsaved aunts. And we need to build that friendship with them. And we need to evangelize. We need to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with them. God will give us the words and the utterance to say. We do need to pray for boldness. God, give me boldness that I won't be ashamed. The Bible says that Paul even prayed that prayer. Lord, give me boldness, God. That I won't be ashamed of your gospel. How do people bring people to God? Now, Billy Graham, his crusade alliance, they began to do research and find out why are people giving their lives over to the Lord. They said, is it the music? They found out, no, it was not the music. They said, is it an anointed message from Billy Graham? They said, no, it wasn't the anointed message from Billy Graham that they thought had brought people to the Lord. They began to find that 80% of all the conversions of those who gave their life over to the Lord, they were brought by a friend. They were bought, brought by a friend. How many of us here today, we got one friend that we know needs Jesus? How many of us here today, we have that one coworker that we know needs the gospel? That we know needs Jesus? Now, today, I want you to examine your heart, examine your life. Take an introspection of your life. When was the last time that you prayed for them, that you genuinely prayed for them, God, save them, Lord, deliver them, Lord, let me redeem the time with them, Lord. Lord, when you give me opportunities, God, to witness with them, let my eyes be open to those opportunities for them, Lord God, that I can witness to them. Let it come naturally, Lord. Let it not become, Lord, canned or, or, or Lord, let it not be mechanical when I share your love with them, God. But let there be an anointing, Lord, that touches their heart. So how do you and I do this? How do we reach the lost today? The first thing that we must do is let us recognize the need. There is a need. There is a need. Today in the world, there is a need for people to give their lives to the Lord. Even in Whittier, there is a great need. 
If we go down to the streets and to the stores, we'll see people there that they need Jesus inside of their life. Our neighbors need Jesus inside of our life. Our coworkers need Jesus inside of our, their lives. So what do we do? We need to know that there is a great, great need. That's why we're starting that church in West Covina. Why is it because uh, we want to build an empire? No, it's because we want to see people saved in West Covina, in the San Gabriel Valley. We want to see people get saved. We want to see people get to the kingdom. And someday when we get to heaven, we're going to be up there in heaven. And somebody's going to come up to you and say, hey, I want to thank you for giving because I gave my life over to the Lord in West Covina. When you gave, when you came, when you prayed, my life was transformed by the power of Jesus Christ. We all have an audience. We all have a, a, a megaphone. We all, all of us do. The Bible says... In Matthew chapter 9, verse 35, it says, Jesus continued going around to all their towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom, healing every disease and every sickness. When he saw the crowds, everyone say he saw the crowd. When he saw the crowd, he felt compassion for them. Compassion. He recognized the need. He recognized the need. Do I recognize the need? Do you recognize the need? Another thing that we must recognize is our responsibility. We are all responsible to share the gospel. The Bible says in the book of Matthew, chapter 28, I'm going to turn there. Book of Matthew, chapter 28. I want you to turn to your neighbor today, and I know we've been doing that a lot, but there's a reason. And I want you to tell them you are responsible to share the gospel. There's a responsibility. There is a mission. I want you to turn to your other neighbor and say, there, you're on a mission. You're on a mission. It, the mission that we are on is the Great Commission. The Great Commission from Jesus. The Bible says this, the 11 disciples traveled to Galilee. Verse 16 of chapter 28, to Galilee, to the mountains where Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshiped, but some doubted. We always have doubters, right? Now I can see all of you guys. You guys look so nice today. Are you ready to share the gospel? You are ready. You look nice. You look really nice. You're ready to share. The Bible says that some doubted. We always have doubters. Turn to your neighbor and say, stop doubting. Say, just believe. I think a lot of times what happens is we go, you know what, I don't know what I'm going to say and I don't know what I'm going to do and I don't know what if they ask me a really tough question and what I'm not no Bible theologian and, and I don't know this and I don't know that. And, and, but let me ask you this, do you know Jesus? You might say that oversimplifies it, but it is really simple. The gospel is powerful, but it's simple. You think about Billy Graham. This man went and he preached the cross. And millions of people gave their lives over to the Lord. You think about David Wilkerson, a farmer from Pennsylvania, a preacher who goes to New York City. He doesn't have no money. He doesn't have no building. And he goes there to the gangs in New York City and God uses them in a powerful way. And we are connected to that lineage there. A man with a simple testimony. All he gave them was the gospel. The Bible says, Jesus came near and said to them, All authority has been given to me in heaven and in earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. Oh, glory to God. Everywhere we go, he's with us. Isn't that amazing? He's with us. He's going to give us the words to say, the words to, to talk about. And I, I want to tell you, every single one of us has a megaphone. And uh, recently we bought a megaphone for our church. Brother Levi said, Pastor, we need a megaphone. So I went on Amazon and bought a megaphone. And 
Well, we, when it came in, we had to go buy a bunch of batteries for this thing. And we were out there, and uh, he goes, let's, I said, let's go, let's, we'll go. And we went to Five Points in Whittier. And let me say this, during this outreach, I really got attacked to not go out. What I meant by that is this, is I got discouraged right before outreach. I didn't want to go. I was like, who's going to listen to me? I said, that's so old-fashioned, you know. You know, that's that just, you know, ah, this and all that. And I was like, you know what, I'm not going to, I don't want to go. But I already said we're going to go, so I had to go. So <laughs> we were there, and Brother Levi was there. Then all kinds of people started, they were right there on five points. And, uh, and I remember I seen the bullhorn, and I said, I have to go first. I'm the pastor, I have to go first. So I went and I grabbed it. And I was right there on five points, and there's all kinds of cars looking at me like, what is this guy going to do? And I said, people of Whittier, people, testing, one, two. Finally, it went on. I said, people of Whittier, I want to tell you a great message that God came. His name, Jesus Christ, came to die for our sins. Die for our sins and he loves you with an everlasting love. And he has a great plan for your life. And he wants to use you. He wants to change you. He wants to fill your life with joy and peace. If you will repent and turn from your sin and turn and trust in Jesus with all of your heart and all of your soul. And we were right there and I got done and I, we were preaching. And then all of a sudden people started honking their horns. And people started saying, what church do you guys go to? And people, and all of a sudden we began to see people began to get stirred. People began to get offended. People began to get angry. People began to get excited. But I remember just right there seeing my brothers and sisters grabbing the bullhorn and sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. And they were just, oh man, they were so excited. And they were so just energized. And let me say this to you. I'm not telling you, you have to do that the next time we do this. But what I am saying is that all of us have one of these. And this might be at your college dorm. This might be on your social media page. How many of you ever made a video lifting up the name of Jesus on your social media page? Where you just began to give him glory. You began to share the gospel with all of your followers. You think about your coworkers, all of us, you have a megaphone with them. You think about your family, some of them will never come into this church, but you have a megaphone with them at those barbecues. How many of you nurses, you work in a hospital and you have a megaphone there in the break room where you can share the gospel of Jesus Christ. My point is this, all of us here today have a megaphone. All of us here today have a story. All of us here today have a testimony. Do I have a witness in here? We all have a testimony. We're all witnesses of the power of Jesus Christ. And I remember when I got on that megaphone, I began to say, hey, my friend, I have a word. And I just began to go back to my days of evangelism as a young man. I began to get stirred up. I began to get fired up. I think sometimes we try to reinvent the wheel. We try to do this method and that method and this thing and that thing. The reality is this, it's the message. The message never changes. My point is this, you can share the gospel on the radio. You can share the gospel in print. You can share the gospel on television. You can share the gospel on social media. Are you sharing though? Are you sharing though? Are you using your megaphone to share the gospel? You got influence. Turn to your neighbor and say you got influence. You got influence to share the gospel. So we have this influence. We pray for boldness inside of our life that God would give us boldness. But how many of us here today, we're scared. Turn to your neighbor and say, are you scared? Some of you are saying, heck no, I ain't going to get that megaphone. That's okay. But it's your responsibility to share the message. You might do it with a whisper. But as long as you're sharing it. You might do it with just you and that other person. But do it. 
Not all of you are going to be there on five points next time we have an outreach. But you're going to have a, a point in your day where you have a chance to share the gospel with someone else. Lifting up the name of Jesus. Tears. As the worship team makes their way up here today, the book of Romans... Book of Romans, chapter 10, O oh Lord, fill our hearts with evangelism. Let us not become complacent, complicit, let us not become dead. Lord, but let us be alive and on fire for you. Oh, God, let just change us. Change us, Lord. Let us. Let us. Be firebrands at our jobs, in our homes, in the markets, in the street corner, online. Let us not be ashamed. Can I say this, guys? I, I'm going to say this. This is something that came to me this morning. I, I said to myself, I said, you can never fail when you share the gospel. Did you know that? You and I, we can never fail when we share the gospel. You that are watching online, you can never fail when you share the gospel. You might say, well, I might not know what to say. God, the Bible says if you open your mouth, he will fill it. You say, well, people might laugh at me. Well, you know what? Good, guess, guess what? You get a reward for being laughed at. You get a reward for that. There's a reward for that. We can never come to the place where we're like, I, I don't want to be confrontational. I don't want people laughing at me. I don't want this. I don't want that. No, it's our responsibility to share the gospel. So we can never fail. I want you to say that with me. Say, I will never fail when I share the gospel. Say it one more time. Say, I will never fail when I share the gospel. Type it on the comments. Say, I will never fail when I share the gospel. We never fail when we share the gospel. It's when we fail to share the gospel that we fail. It's when we fail to share the good news that we fail. It's not when we share the gospel because we never fail when we share the gospel. There's rewards tied in to sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's when you and I choose, deliberately choose to be quiet and silent and say, oh, I'm not going to say nothing. No, we need to be bold as lions. We need to be stand up. The Bible says in the book of Romans, chapter 10, verse 9, it says these words. It says, if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. One believes with the heart, resulting in righteousness, and one confesses with the mouth, resulting in salvation. For the scripture says, everyone who believes on him will not be put to shame. Since there's no distinction between Jew and Greek, because the same Lord of all richly blesses all who call upon him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then? Now that's good news. It's like, hey, if I call on God's name, if I repent, I will be saved. Now, Paul, he gives us a rhetorical question to believers. 
And this question is for myself, for you today. And he says this, he goes, how can they call on him they have not believed in? And how can they believe without hearing about him? Paul's saying, guys, how can they give their life to the Lord if nobody's talking about him? Nobody's sharing about him. No one's witnessing, no one's declaring, no one's conveying, no one's letting people know about him. How can they know? Then he goes on to say this, he goes, and how can they hear without a preacher? And how can they preach unless they are sent? As is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. I want you to look at your feet right now. Look at your shoes right now. When you're sharing the gospel, you got beautiful feet. I don't care how crusty they are. If you're sharing the gospel, you got beautiful feet. You're putting some anointing oil on them as you're witnessing and sharing the gospel. It says, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring the good news. But not all obey the gospel. For Isaiah said, Lord, who has believed our message so faith comes from hearing. And hearing comes from the message of Christ. But I say, did they not hear? Yes, they did hear today. Church, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God brings it back to this place. When someone told you about Jesus and they opened their mouth, what if they kept their mouth closed? What if they didn't say nothing? You never would have had your faith because faith cometh by hearing. Faith cometh by hearing because someone, they said, God give me boldness as I witness to Brother Levi. Somebody said, God, give me boldness as I witness to Brother George Sendeja. Someone said, God, give me boldness as I witness to Jasmine. God, give me boldness as I witness God to Brother Steve. God, give me boldness. Somebody said, God, give me boldness. Somebody said the message. Somebody said, God, give me boldness. And they had that boldness. They shared the gospel. And God brought you in today. I know. I believe. I declare. I decree. God is going to bring in a harvest into this church. Not only our church, but the churches here that share the gospel of Jesus. And I believe that God's going to bring men, men, women, young and old. They're going to come into this church and God's going to set them free. We're not even going to have enough room for them. God's going to have to, God's going to, have to do a miracle. We're going to have to have supernatural room. Are we going to have to get a supernatural church building? <laughs> we don't know what God's going to do, but God's going to do something. We don't even fit here right now, thank you, Jesus. But God's going to bring them in if we will what? If we will open our mouths and declare the gospel. Let's not be ashamed. Let's not be scared. Let's not be fearful today. Let's pray, God, give me boldness. Give me boldness. Give me boldness to declare your word in a way that honors you, that glorifies your name. We could all stand here today. Lord, we thank you for your grace and your goodness and your mercy. And we pray today that you would fill our hearts with boldness and strength. You would transform lives by your power, by your anointing. And maybe you're here today say, you know what, Pastor Danny, I want to join God's family. I want my sins forgiven. We want to pray with you today. If you could do us one favor. If you could raise your hand up right where you're at. Raise your hand up right where you're at. We're going to pray for you. We're going to believe God for you. Raise it up. We're going to pray. God loves you. He has a great plan and a purpose for your life. Raise your hand up right where you're at. You won't be alone. We're going to pray for you. But we promise you won't be alone when we come up here and we pray for you. Maybe you're here today. You're running from God. And you want to join God's family. Raise your hand up. Yes. Say yes to Jesus. Say, yes, I would like Christ inside of my life. I want my sins forgiven. I want my sins forgiven. For those that are watching online, maybe you're there, you're hearing me. You want to join God's family. You want to repent of your sins. You want to turn to the Lord. Repeat this prayer with me. Turn from your sins. The Bible says this. If you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, you will be saved. Say this prayer. Say, Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross. 
for every one of my sins. I believe that you died and you rose again on the third day. From this day forward, Lord, my life is yours. I pray that you'd fill me with your spirit, with your strength, with your wisdom. Have your way in my heart, in my life. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. If you said that prayer, you meant it. If you can let us know in the comments or let us know after our service in the First Steps Lounge over there in the corner, we would love to get to know you and pray for you more. Believer, Christian, how many are ready to share the gospel with your friends, with your co-workers? Some of you are like, oh, I think so. No, let me say this. God will give you the moment in time. God will give you the words and the utterance. God will give you the boldness and the strength. But today as you come up to the altar today, we're going to pray for a miracle. We're going to pray, God, give me a new perspective. Give me a new hunger, God, for the lost, God. God, give me a burden for them. Don't let me not care, but let me have compassion in this heart. Fill me with compassion, God. So today, right now, while we make our way up here today, and we're going to pray as a church, we're going to believe God as a people of God. Lord, we pray right now, thanking you, Lord.